Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wheeler Centre for tonight's event, Wiring Our Brain with Nicholas Carr. Uh, I have first to ask you to turn off all phones, iPhones, iPads, iBooks, iRobots, iClaudiuses, um, all PDAs of that, of that description. Why? Because it's good for you. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, Nicholas Carr, author of The Shallows. And I was, when I was thinking about how I would introduce him, I was going to say, Nicholas Carr, your book, The Shallows, I haven't read it because I've had a very busy week tweeting and using Facebook, but I have skimmed it. <laughs> it's about the internet, yeah? That's a joke. Uh, I read it with very great pleasure. Uh, and where I read it was interesting. I, um, I was very early for a flight from Canberra last week in an airport and then I was on a plane so I had three or four hours of time without distraction which I particularly appreciated when it came to the part where Nicholas described the circumstances under which his book was written. Uh, Nicholas you call us these days lab rats constantly pressing levers to get tiny pellets of social and intellectual nourishment. How did you get out of the cage? <laughs> Well, it was uh, a few years ago that I, I start to, started to see the, the lab rat in myself. Um, and like many people, I'd been using, the, using personal computers and the web and online services for, for years and, and ever more intensively as more information and more services moved on to the net and as our gadgets got smaller and more portable. Um, but what I noticed was that I was losing my own ability to concentrate. Mm. Um, I'd sit down uh, with a book or with a long article, and after you know a few paragraphs, uh, uh, maybe a few pages, my mind I I realized wanted to behave the way it behaved when I was online, when mm. I was looking into a screen. It it didn't want to stay fixed on one argument or one narrative. Uh, it wanted to jump from page to page, from bit of information to bit of information. It wanted to, you know, click links and Google and check email. Um, and, I, and, I, and I began to make a connection between that lack of ability to concentrate in myself and all the time I had spent, uh, been spending online. Um, so I, uh, and, and that started me down the road that ultimately led to the book. And in the course of that, I, I mean, I tried to, to back away uh, from the technology to a degree, and uh, you know, dropped off of Facebook and Twitter, and tried not to check my email as often as, as I had. And you know, I certainly didn't didn't throw out my computer or anything because it's extremely valuable for for research. But I did did try to back away. And after a short period of panic, when you think, oh my gosh, you know, somebody's actually exchanging a message out there and I'm not seeing it, <laughs> uh, you kind of calm down and realize, you know, that was pretty trivial stuff to begin with. Why, why do I care? And you do kind of, I, I, at least I found, you know, you, you suddenly kind of regain some of your mm -hmm. ability to pay attention and you find your mind kind of calming down mm -hmm. and you can do some, some thinking that, some, you know, ways of thinking that don't really, aren't really encouraged when you're mm. juggling things mm. all day long. Mm. Your book abounds in, in useful phrases and, and concepts for discussion where this area is concerned. And one I found particularly interesting was the intellectual ethic of an innovation. The set of assumptions about how the mind works or should work contained in an innovation. What is the intellectual ethic of the online universe and what does it mean to us? Yeah. Um, well, as I looked back in, uh, through the history of, of technology, and in particular, uh, the history of the tools we use to think with, uh, organizing information, sharing information, uh, it became clear to me, and, you know, and in the book I go all the way back to like the map and, and then the clock and other, other technologies, that when we, that embedded in these technologies is are certain assumptions about how we should use our minds, mm. in, in particular how we should best use our minds. And this is kind of what I call the ethic of the technology. Um, and so if you, and, and by the way, the, you know, to the inventors and even to the users of the technology, they might be completely oblivious mm. to, this, to this ethic because they're, uh, as, as tool makers and tool users, we're focusing on the practical uses and benefits we get. And, uh, and we don't 
particularly pay attention to the deeper changes these technologies might be uh, imposing on us mm -hmm. in, in our ways of thinking. And I think um, for, if you, one of the contrasts I make is between the online world and the on paper world. And if you think about the printed page and particularly the book, I think its ethic is a, an ethic of, of deep attentiveness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the great thing about a printed page is there's nothing else going on. It's, uh, it shields you from distraction and mm -hmm. focuses you on one line of argument or one story for a long period of time. And I think the ethic of the online world, the ethic of the internet, is precisely the opposite. Mm -hmm. What it values and what it encourages in us is the rapid discovery and rapid intake of, of all sorts of little bits of information. Mm -hmm. So this a kind of constant s state of distractedness and interruptions and skimming and scanning. And it, on the other hand, you know, it provides us with very little, if any, opportunity or encouragement to engage in more mm -hmm. attentive, quieter, contemplative modes of thought. Yes, the phenomenon that you call deep reading, which is a lovely, um, a lovely expression, and I enjoyed your appreciation of deep reading as a kind of an index of, of civilization. Uh, there's a lovely line in, or um, well, lovely paragraph in Nicholas's book, a quote from the medieval Bishop Isaac of Syria, where he describes the act of reading, and he says, as in a dream I enter a state when my sense and thoughts are concentrated, then with prolonging the silence, the turmoil of memories is stilled in my heart, ceaseless waves of joy are sent me by my inner thoughts, beyond expectation suddenly arising to delight my heart. One of the reasons that deep reading was such a step for us is that our natural state is one of distractedness. We are innately predisposed to shift our gaze to different objects and to different subjects. If distractedness is our natural state, then need we be worried about the intellectual ethic of the web? I, I think we do, because Natu our natural state is not necessarily our optimum state. Mm. It's not necessarily the most desirable state. And I think the fact, um, and, and I've heard you know, people argue, well, you know, we're naturally adept at juggling distractions and interruptions. And, and I think that's true. And I think that's why it's so easy to kind of fall into the net's kind of habits of mm. thought. Um, and in fact, you know, if you look at the science of it, there's kind of a, a deep and I think very primitive craving for distraction, for, for new information. Mm. And you get a little, you know, a little, a little charge of, uh, of dopamine or, you know, a pleasure producing chemical when you get a new, mm. new bit of information. Um, but I think that, you know, in, in, in some ways, the history of civilization is, is a history of how we overcome that mm. desire to be constantly distracted and to constantly shift our attention among different stimuli and how we learned to pay attention. And I think that, you know, the, the quote from, uh, uh, from the early reader, the, the bishop, kind of gets across mm. this sense of surprise and kind of an opening up of, of consciousness mm when you are lost in a book, as we say, yes. or immersed in a book. So I think, you know, I think much of the richness, and this isn't to take away the, from the importance of being able to multitask and to shift our attention and to juggle things, which is all very, very important. But if we lose kind of that, that deeper mode of thinking, the more attentive mode of thinking, I think we're going to lose a lot of the richness of our individual intellectual lives mm and ultimately some of the richness of our culture, which I think is built on that mm. capability. Mm. Some of this argument strikes me as akin to the, um, the one about, in a slightly more trivial sense, punctuation that raged a few years ago when Lynn Truss's book came out. And there was a group out there who were sort of embattled and oppressed and um, they found themselves validated by the idea that the values of traditional English expression were, were being rewarded by Lynn Truss and there were others who took this optimistic view that, that language evolves and we shouldn't care that people put apostrophes in 80s and focaccias. Uh, because for many years, web utopians have been pointing to experiments involving these the off-the-scale neural activity of computer games players as a kind of a justification for the idea that the, the web will breed a race of super geniuses, <laughs> which has been kind of hard to cop because, you know, you meet computer games players and they're proverbially dull, inarticulate social misfits. Can you, can you talk about neural activity and its correlation to, to intelligence? Sure. There's... And it's definitely true that there have been now quite a few studies of, of video gaming. Um, 
that show a couple of things. One is that, and this isn't a particular surprise when you think about it, you know, the more that you play video games, the better, the quicker, the better you become at, a, at being able to shift your focus among mm. lots of mm. different things, because, you know, that's the essence of doing well in, a, in mm. most action video games anyway, is to be able to uh, kind of be aware of everything that's going on mm. and know where to shift your focus. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not surprising that those kind of skills would be enhanced. Um, but there's also, the, uh, and, and this is also this pattern of kind of brain activation, you know, beyond video games, it's also seen in like Google searching and, and, and surfing. It's a very broad pattern of brain activity. In particular, lots of uh, intense activity in your, in your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that it gets very active when you're making decisions, uh, when you're uh, weighing different information and solving a problem. And there's certainly nothing wrong with, with that pattern of activity. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's essential to kind of immediate problem solving and decision making uh, 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 aspects of our lives. On the other hand, you know, often this is mistaken for uh, good bra or, or the best possible brain mm. activity. There's this kind of sense that the more of our brain that is, you know, firing up and the, the, the more cells that are going mm. off, the better. And uh, in fact, it's, it's not like that at all. If you look at the, if you look at, for instance, the brain of a uh, experienced reader, when they are practicing deep reading, it's a much quieter picture. And in mm. fact, uh, a lot of the decision-making parts of the brain aren't being activated. And that's very different from when you look at a very young rate reader, mm. early reader, when in fact they are making decisions because they're they're spending all their kind of brain energy decoding, you know, mm. what's mm. what's what is this word? What do these letters mean? How does it fit into the sentence? As you become more adept at reading, those kind of decision making, problem solving parts of your brain quiet down. Mm. And the theory is that that is linked with the kind of rich interpretive and emo even emotional mm -hmm. and intellectual experience you have when you read deeply. So there is a mode. Of, so it's wrong to think that the more brain activity, the better. Mm -hmm. There's in fact very rich ways of thinking that require us to have, you know, what's best described as a calmer, quieter mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the internet in relation to other media? Um, it's often assumed that the time we spend online comes instead of the time that we would spend watching TV, for instance. But in fact, there seems to be quite a strong overlap between TV viewing and net surfing. It's the reading of old sources of media that seem to be falling precipitously, books, magazines, newspapers. What are the implications for the culture of that? Yeah, and, and it, it is pretty clear that what the activity that is being displaced in terms of what media we use, what information we, we draw on from our increasing use of the, the web is our reading of print mm -hmm. media. Um, and I, I don't have statistics for Australia, but if you, I, you know, if you, if you look at the statistics in the United States and in, in Britain, and I assume it's very similar here, you see that even though people say, well, you know, at least we're watching less TV while we're mm. online. In fact, TV viewing hours have gone up steadily throughout mm. the web era, and in fact, are now at their at their peak since you know back in the in the 50s when the, these things began to be measured. Um, and and so, for instance, in the U.S. now, people are looking at screens on average eight and a half hours a day, and in Britain, it's seven hours. Um, in that, you know, when you think about it, that's a heck of a lot of time of your waking hours. And, but if you look at the time spent reading, reading printed word, the printed word, it's been going down mm. just as steadily. Mm. And I think it's like 20 minutes a day now in, in the U.S. And so, you know, I, I think in, there's, you know, the, there's a lot of pleasure and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to be gained and a lot to be said for looking at screens sometimes. And, uh, and I certainly don't think, you know, that's in and of itself bad, but there are, you know, there, there is, there are cultural riches that mm. aren't particularly available or at mm. least not easily available, um, through the internet or through TV or whatever. And if all of our time is, is shifting in that direction, then, you know, necessarily we're giving up mm. something. And, and mm. I fear that what we're giving up, the experiences we're giving up um, are at least 
as important as what we're gaining and probably considerably mm. more important. One of, one of the things that has struck me about the sort of the nostrums of the of the netterati is that they, they sort of have ideological support across the spectrum. The left hate the mainstream media because they perceive it as enthralled to corporate power. The right hate it because they perceive journalists as just a bunch of liberal weenies. The mainstream media hates the mainstream media because they've set out over the last five or ten years and tried to act like online content providers, peddlers of a slick, short, shiny, shoddy garbage aimed at imaginary, ignorant, time-poor consumerists. Why is there so little interest in defending the existing institutions of our culture and such a rush to embrace these new forms? Well, that's... That may be a question that stumps me because it's, it's a mystery... To me as well, I mean, there, I think you've, you've described perfectly the way, you know, everybody has, seems to have a, a reason to mm. kind of dismiss mm. traditional media. And, you know, beyond the ideo ideological questions, I think it also reflects the change in our habits that if we are teaching ourselves to be perpetually distracted and perpetually craving new information, we become less able to appreciate uh, sitting down and reading a book or, or a long, complex magazine article. And so if you become less able to do that and less appreciative of it, then it becomes easier to dismiss mm -hmm. those things mm -hmm. and to kind of define the, the, the you know, the optimal intellectual life as consisting of stuff you you can take in easily and mm. and, and and kind of your ability to grab uh, to stay on top of all sorts mm. of different messaging streams all sorts of different incoming information so it may simply it may actually reflect kind of changes in our intellectual habits our mm. habits of mind mm. ours may be the generation that sees off the physical book in favor of e-readers of various descriptions. Can you explain how the reading experience changes with the enhancement and the dynamizing of text by, for instance, things like hypertext? Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, people have been hyping up e-readers now for 12 years, say, and, mm. and really nobody has paid any attention to them. I mean, they've been this kind of tiny, tiny fragment of the market. But what we've seen in the last two years is really a big, a big shift now, thanks to things like Amazon's Kindle and the iPad and other e-readers, um, which are frankly much more pleasant to read than they used to be. And, and uh, as the cost of e-books gets pushed down, thanks mainly to Amazon.com, which wants to take over the whole publishing industry, but um, you know, people are making that shift. And, and, and I think in the U.S., for instance, uh, e-books as a share of the total book market were about 1% or 2% a couple of years ago, are now around 9% and are growing very, very rapidly. So I think we are, books were protected in a way for, for many years from mm. uh, the shift to online in a way that newspapers and magazines yes. weren't. But I think we're beginning to see that shift take place now. And I think what happens is what always happens when you begin moving information to a networked computer. Um, in the early stages, you know, an e-reader might do a fairly good job of replicating the page. And, and, you know, Amazon's Kindle, I think, falls into that category because many of its other functions are kind of crippled for, for economic reasons, really, in, in keeping the device cheap. But what happens in the history of gadgets is that... Um, the producers of them, the, the makers of them, compete on their ability to add new features. Mm. Um, and you can see this over and over again. Uh, and we're already beginning to see it with ebook readers that, you know, suddenly you have hyperlinks being added mm. to the text. You have Amazon introducing cer certain social networking functions. You can you, you share highlighted text with, every, mm. with all your friends who are reading the same book. Um, and you, you can do Google searches and the least rudimentary types of web browsing and stuff. And, you know, when you look at e any of those features individually, you can say, oh, this is useful. This adds mm. something new. But what, what, what's happening is we're losing the kind of, uh, we're losing the book's basic greatest feature, which was nothing else was going on. Mm. And we're beginning to, turn. What, what I fear is we're going to begin to turn books into basically 
websites. Uh, and already you have publishers talking about bringing video into books and audio into books because, you know, as soon as you have a computer, it can do all of these yes. things. And it's very hard to say, let's, let's not do them. It's much easier to say, let's do them. And what we, there have been lots of studies, for instance, of comparisons of what it's like to read hypertext, text with links, versus regular mm. book text, books, I mean, text without links. And it's very striking that when you begin to add links to text, reading comprehension begins to go down. Mm. And it's not just because of people clicking on the links and going somewhere else. You would expect that to be, you know, that as we all know, that's quite a distraction for all the benefits we get from it. But simply having a link there, even if you don't click on it, seems to create a distraction. Mm. And I think mm. uh, the reason it does is, goes back to the, your, you, ha, you activating the kind of decision-making and problem-solving parts of your brain, because anytime there's a link, you at least have to evaluate it yes. and say, do I want to click on this or mm. not? And this happens very quickly, so we don't even notice it, uh, but it, it is a distraction. It divides our attention, and as a result, reading comprehension goes down. And if it was just links, that would be one thing, but inevitably you begin to get multimedia, which has the same effect, and oh yeah, your Twitter feed or your Facebook updates can be uh, you know, streamed through the same device. And so it, you know, the, placid, the placidity of, of reading starts to be mm. disrupted. Mm. What about an education? I've often been struck by the educational assumption that somehow rich media will, will deepen comprehension and, and strengthen learning. You don't describe it so, but it's a little bit like the dogma of the learning must be fun school. You know, if we make it all look like an electronic game, we might smuggle a fact or two past their stubborn apathy. Uh, but you tell us that the research on this subject is almost all to the contrary. Can you explain how? Yeah, back in the back before the the web came along, back in the 1980s, um, schools, you know, that's when. Personal computers began to become popular, and obviously they became increasingly popular in schools. Uh, one reason, of course, is that Apple and other manufacturers mm -hmm. uh, made a big marketing effort to get them into schools, and, and, and parents and educators began to equate kind of technology with the quality of an education. And along with that, there was, there was a great deal of enthusiasm about using, uh, you know, getting rid of replacing kind of the printed textbook with the on-screen display of information and there was enthusiasm about about hypertext and mm. you know kids would be able rather than read one thing at a time they'd be able to make all these comparisons that you can do with hyperlinks and there was also uh, a sense that bringing in uh, multimedia which which as you said was often referred to as rich media uh, would also aid in learning kind of this this assumption that you know the more stimulus mm. the better mm. And by the, the early 90s, uh, actual research into what happens when kids are stimulated in this way began to show a very different effect mm. that, and, and you know, it's, it's not particularly surprising that, in fact, you know, if, you're, uh, if your concentration is broken uh, all the time, if your attention is divided, uh, your, learn, your ability to learn goes down. And a lot of it relates relates to a basic constraint in our brains, which is that we have uh, two very different kinds of memory. We have short-term memory, which mm. is often called working memory, which is basically the contents of our consciousness. It's what, what we're experiencing second to second. And then we have our, our long-term memory, which is mm. exactly what it says, where we hold our store of facts and experiences over the long-term. And long-term memory is hugely expansive. There are there are basically no limits to what it can hold, whereas short-term or working memory is extremely constrained. You can fit you know, th three, four, five maybe bits of information at a time. And what's necessary, uh, it's pretty clear, to move information from working memory to long-term memory is concentration, mm. is paying attention. Because if you're, if, if, you know, if you're experiencing things through multimedia and all sorts of things coming at you at once, then things come in in and out of your working memory very, very quickly and never make the transition uh, to long-term memory. And the reason that's a problem is it's only when we, or, and certainly children, move things into long-term mm. memory that you weave it together with other facts and yes. other experiences, and that's how you learn, that's how you develop conceptual knowledge. So uh, what we found is that, in, in there's, you know, there are certainly, certainly times when 
you know, having more, you know, showing pictures along with words can be very valuable. But the the assumption that you know more stimulus mm. is better is is actually completely wrong. Mm.